Chapter Eight of The Sky Is Falling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Karen Savage. The Sky Is Falling by Lester Del Rey. Chapter Eight. The great rock's hard drumming wings set up a constant sound of rushing air, and the distance flowed behind them. There was the rush of wind all around them, but on the bird's back they were in an area where everything seemed calm. Only when Hansen looked over toward the ground was he fully conscious of the speed they were making. From the height he could see where the sun had landed. It was sinking slowly into the earth, lying in a great fused hole. For miles around, smaller drops of the three-mile diameter sun had spattered and were etching deeper holes in the pitted landscape. Then they began passing over desolate country, scoured by winds, gloomy from the angry glaring clouds above. Once two bodies went hurtling upwards toward the great gaps in the sky. "'Those risings were from men who were no worshippers of the egg's hatching,' Bork commented. "'It's spreading. Something is drawing them up from all over the planet.' Later half a square mile of the shell cracked off. The rock squawked harshly, but it had learned and had been watching above. By a frantic effort of the great wings it missed the hurtling chunk. They dropped a few thousand feet in the winds that followed the piece of sky, but their altitude was still safe. Then they passed over a town, flying low. The sights below were out of a ghoul's bacchanalia. As the rock swept over, the people stopped their frenzied pursuit of sensation and ran for weapons. A cloud of arrows hissed upwards, all fortunately too late. "'They blame all their troubles on the magicians,' Bork explained. "'They've been shooting at everything that flies. Not a happy time to associate with the Cytheri, is it?" Nima drew further back from him. "'We're not all cowards like you. Only rats desert a sinking ship.' "'Nobody thought it was sinking when I deserted,' Bork reminded her. "'Anyhow, if you've been using your eyes and seen the way we are travelling, you'd know I've rejoined the crew. I've made up with the Sather Karf, and at a time like this our great-grandfather was glad to have me back.' Nima rushed toward him in delight, but Hansen wasn't convinced. Why? he asked. Bork sobered. One of the corpses that fell back from the risings added a word to what the others had said. No, I'll bear the weight of it myself, and not burden you with it. But I'm convinced now that this egg should not hatch. I had doubts before, unlike our friend Malak, who also heard the words, but is doubly the fanatic now. Perhaps the hatching cannot be stopped, but I've decided that I am a man, and must fight like one against the fates. So though I still oppose much that the Sathari have done, I have gone back to them. We'll be at the camp of the Sather Karf shortly." That sewed everything up neatly, Hansen thought. Before he had been torn between two alternatives. Now there was only one, and he had no choice. He could never trust the sons of the egg with Bork turned against them. He stared up at the sky, realizing that more than half of it had already fallen. The rest seemed too weak to last much longer. It probably didn't make much difference what he did now or who had him. Time was running out for this world. The light was dimmer by the time they reached the great capital city, or what was left of it. They had left the sun-pyre far to the south. The air was growing cold already. The rock flew low over the city. The few people on the streets looked up and made threatening gestures, but there was no flight of arrows from the ground. Probably the men below had lost even the strength to hate. It was hard to see, since there was no electric lighting system now, but it seemed to Hansen that only the oldest and ugliest buildings were still standing. Honest stone and metal could survive, but the work of magic was no longer safe. One of the remaining buildings seemed to be a hospital, and the empty space in front of it was crammed with people. Most of them seemed to be dead or unconscious. Squat mandrakes were carrying off bodies toward a great fire that was burning in another square. Plague and pestilence had apparently gotten out of hand. They flew on, beyond the city, toward the construction camp that had been Hansen's headquarters. The rock was beginning to drop into a long landing glide, and details below were easier to see. Along the beach beyond the city a crowd had collected. They had a fire going, and were preparing to cook one of the mermaids. A fight was already going on over the prey. Food must have been exhausted days before. The camp was a mess when they reached it. One section had been ripped down by the lash of wind from a huge piece of the sky, which now lay among the ruins with a few stars glowing inside it. There was a brighter glow beyond. 
Apparently one blob of material from the sun had been tossed all the way here, and had landed against a huge rock to spatter into fragments. The heat from those fragments cut through the chill in the air, and the glow furnished light for most of the camp. The tents had been burned, but there was a new building where the main tent had been. This was obviously a hasty construction job, thrown together of rocks and tree trunks, without the use of magic. It was more of an enormous lean-to than a true building, but it was the best protection now available. Hansen could see Sather Karf and Sirsa Garm waiting outside, together with less than a hundred other warlocks. The mandrakes prodded Hansen down from the rock and toward the new building, then left at a wave of the Sather Karf's hand. The old man stared at Hansen intently, but his expression was unreadable. He seemed to have aged a thousand years. Finally he lifted his hand in faint greeting, sighed, and dropped slowly to a seat. His face seemed to collapse, with the iron running out of it. He looked like a beaten, sick, old man. His voice was toneless. "'Fix the sky, Dave Hansen.' There were angry murmurs from other warlocks in the background, but Sather Karf shook his head slowly, still facing Hansen. "'No. What good to threaten dire punishments, or to torture you when another day or week will see the end of everything? What good to demand your reasons for desertion when time is so short? Fix the sky, and claim what reward you will afterwards. We have few powers now that the basis of astrology is ruined. But repair our sky, and we can reward you beyond your dreams. We can find ways to return you to your own world intact. You have near immortality now. We can fill that entire lifetime with pleasures. We'll give you jewels to buy an empire or if it is vengeance against whatever you feel we are, you shall know my secret name and the name of every one here. Do with us, then, what you like, but fix the sky." It shook Hansen. He had been prepared to face fury, or to try lying his way out if there was a chance with some story of having needed to study Menace's methods, or of being lost. But he had no defense prepared against such an appeal. It was utterly mad. He could do nothing, and their demands were impossible. But before the picture of the world dying and the decay of the old Sather's pride, even Hansen's own probable death with the dying world seemed unimportant. He might at least give them something to hope for while the end came. Maybe, he said slowly, maybe if all of the men you brought here to work on the problem were to pool their knowledge, we might still find the answer. How long will it take to get them here for a council?" Sir Perth appeared from the group. Hansen had thought the man dead in the ruins of the pyramid, but somehow he had survived. The fat was going from his face, and his moustache was untrimmed, but he was uninjured. He shook his head sadly. "'Most have disappeared with their projects. Two escaped us. Menace is dead. Cagliostro tricked us successfully. You are all we have left, and we can't even supply labour beyond those you see here. The people no longer obey us, since we have no food to give them." "'You're the only hope,' Bork agreed. They've saved what they could of the tools from the camp and what magical instruments are still useful. They've held on only for your return." Hansen stared at them and around at the collection of bric-a-brac and machinery they had assembled for him. He opened his mouth, and his laughter was a mockery of their hopes and of himself. "'Dave Hansen, world-saver! You got the right name but the wrong man, Sather Karf," he said bitterly. He'd been a pretender long enough, and what punitive action they took now didn't seem to matter. You wanted my uncle, David Arnold Hansen, but because his friends called him Dave and cut that name on his monument, and because I was christened by the name you called, you got me instead. He'd have been helpless here, probably, but with me you have no chance. I couldn't even build a doghouse. I wasn't even a construction engineer, just a computer operator and repairman." He regretted ruining their hopes almost as he said it. But he could see no change on the old Sather's face. It seemed to stiffen slightly and become more thoughtful, but there was no disappointment. "'My grandson Borg told me all that,' he said. Yet your name was on the monument, and we drew you back by its use. Our ancient prophecy declared that we should find omnipotence carved on stone in a pool of water, as we found your name. Therefore, by the laws of rational magic, it is you to whom nothing is impossible. We may have mistaken the direction of your talent, but nonetheless it is you who must fix the sky." 
What form of wonder is a computer? Dave shook his head at the old man's monomania. Just a tool. It's a little hard to explain, and it couldn't help. Humor my curiosity, then. What is a computer, Dave Hansen? Nima's hand rested on Hansen's arm pleadingly, and he shrugged. He groped about for some answer that could be phrased in their language, letting his mind flicker from the modern electronic gadgets back to the old-time tide predictor. An analog computer is a machine that, that sets up conditions mathematically similar to the conditions in some problem, and then lets all the operations proceed while it draws a graph, a prediction, of how the real conditions would turn out. If the tides change with the position of some heavenly body, then we can build cams that have shapes, like the effect of the moon's orbit, and gear them together in the right order. If there are many factors, we have a cam for each factor, shaped like the periodic rise and fall of that factor. They're all geared to let the various factors operate at the proper relative rate. With such a machine, we can run off a graph of the tides for years ahead. Oh, hell, it's a lot more complicated than that, but it takes the basic facts and draws a picture of the results. We use electronic ones now, but the results are the same." "'I understand,' Sather Karf said. Dave doubted it, but he was happy to be saved from struggling with a more detailed explanation. And maybe the old man did understand some of it. He was no fool in his own subject, certainly. Sather Karf pondered for a moment, and then nodded with apparent satisfaction. "'Your world was more advanced in understanding than I had thought. This computer is a fine scientific instrument, obeying natural law well. We have applied the same methods, though less elaborately, but the basic magical principle of similarity is the foundation of true science." Dave started to protest, and then stopped, frowning. In a way, what the other had said was true. Maybe there was some relation between science and magic after all. There might even be a meeting ground between the laws of the two worlds he knew. Computers set up similar conditions, with the idea that the results would apply to the original. Magic used some symbolic part of a thing in manipulations that were to be effective for the real thing. The essential difference was that science was predictive, and magic was effective, though the end results were often the same. On Dave's world, the cardinal rule of logic was that the symbol was not the thing, and work done on symbols had to be translated by hard work into reality. Maybe things were really more logical here, where the symbol was the thing, and all the steps in between thought and result were saved. "'So, we are all at fault,' Sather Karf said finally. "'We should have studied you more deeply, and you should have been more honest with us. Then we could have obtained a computer for you, and you could have simulated our sky as it should be within your computer, and forced it to be repaired long ago. But there's no time for regrets now. We cannot help you, so you must help yourself.' Build a computer, Dave Hansen. It's impossible. Sudden rage burned on the old man's face, and he came to his feet. His arm jerked back and snapped forward. Nothing happened. He grimaced at the ruined sky. Dave Hansen, he cried sharply, by the unfailing power of your name which is all of you, I hold you in my mind and your throat is in my hand. The old hand squeezed suddenly, and Hansen felt a vice clamp down around his throat. He tried to break free, but there was no escape. The old man mumbled, and the vice was gone. But something clawed at Hansen's liver, something else rasped across his sciatic nerve, his kidneys seemed to be wrenched out of him. "'You will build a computer,' Sather Karf ordered, "'and you will save our world!' Hansen staggered from the shock of the pain. But he was no longer unused to agony. He had spent too many hours under the baking of the sun, the agony of the snether knife, and the lash of an overseer's whip. The agony could not be stopped, but he'd learned that it could be endured. His fantastic body could heal itself against whatever they did to him, and his mind refused to accept the torture supinely. He took a step toward Sather Karf, and another. His hands came up as he moved forward. Bork laughed suddenly. "'Let up, Sather Karf, or you'll regret it. By the laws, you're dealing with a man this time. Let up, or I'll free him to meet you fairly." The old man's eyes blazed hotly. Then he sighed and relaxed. The clutching hands and the pain were gone from Hansen, as the Sather Karf slumped back wearily to his seat. "'Fix our sky,' the old man said woodenly. Hansen staggered back, panting from his efforts, but he nodded. 
"'All right,' he agreed. "'Like Bork, I think a man has to fight against his fate, no matter how little chance he has. I'll do what I can. I'll build the damned computer. But when I'm finished, I'll wait for your true name.' Suddenly Sather Karf laughed. "'Well said, Dave Hansen. You'll have my name when the time comes, and whatever else you desire. Also, what poor help we can give you now. Sir Perth, bring food for Dave Hansen.' Sir Perth shook his head sadly. "'There is none. None at all. We hoped that the remaining planets would find a favorable conjunction, but—' Dave Hansen studied his helpers with more bitterness. "'Oh, hell!' he said at last. He snapped his fingers. "'Abracadabra!' His skill must be improving, since he got exactly what he had wished for. A full side of beef materialized against his palm, almost breaking his arm before he could snap it out of the way. The others swarmed hungrily toward it. At their expressions of wonder, Hansen felt more confidence returning to him. He concentrated, and went through the little ritual again. This time loaves of bread rained down, fresh bread, and even of the brand he had wished for. Maybe he was becoming a magician himself, with a new magic that might still accomplish something. Sather Carve smiled approvingly. "'The theory of resonance, I see. Unreliable, generally. More of an art than a science but you show promise of remarkable natural ability to apply it. You know about it?" Dave had assumed that it was completely outside their experience and procedures. We knew it. But when more advanced techniques took over, most of us forgot it. The syllables resonate in a sound pattern with your world, to which you also still resonate. It won't work for you with anything from this world, nor will anything work thus for us from yours. We had different syllables, of course, for use here. Sather Karf considered it. But if you can control it, and bring in one of your computers, or the parts for one— Sixteen tries later, Dave was cursing as he stared at a pile of useless items. He'd gotten transistors at first. Then he lost control with too much tension or fatigue, and began getting a bunch of assorted junk, such as old 201A tubes, a transit, a crystal vase, and resistors. But the chief trouble was that he couldn't secure working batteries. He had managed a few, but all were dead. "'Like the soul, electrical charges will not transfer,' Sather Karf agreed sadly. "'I should have told you that.' There was no electricity here with which to power anything, and their spells could not be made to work now. Even if he could build a computer out of what was obtainable, there would be no way to power it. Overhead the sky shattered with a roar, and another piece fell, tearing downwards toward the city. Sir Sagarm stared upwards in horror. "'Mars!' he croaked. "'Mars has fallen! Now there can be no conjunction ever!' He tautened, and his body rose slowly from the ground. A scream ripped from his lips and faded away as he began rushing upwards with increasing speed. He passed out of their sight, straight toward the new hole in the sky. End of chapter 8